So uploading files, most of you are probably already familiar. Um, in our studio, you can do it just by point and click. Um, it's under the Tools tab, and then Import Data Set, and then it has like a little wizard that will walk you through it um, manually, which you probably already use, which is if you know the um, address of the file that you need. And then finally, there's a piece of code called file.choose, which opens a file browser, and then that allows you to navigate through your directory to find the file that you want. And um, I work with all my data in a text file, and so I always use the um, command read.table, um, and there is an error that should just be a colon, not a semicolon. So down here, I've in, this, in the R code that I've given you, there's a lot of annotation. I hope it hopefully explains everything pretty explicitly. Um, here's this piece of code file that choose, and then finally, you know, here's the actual importing of the data. Again, remember that header needs to equal false for the hatmap genotype file format. And then finally, you know, the phenotype file here at the bottom. So doing analyses, I think the biggest piece of advice would be knowing your data, knowing what it looks like, knowing how it was generated, what your family structure is like. Um, I got one question about analyzing uh, a NAM population with GAPIT. And, you know, the short answer is, yeah, you could do a preliminary analysis using GAPIT, but you probably want to do something else given the unique population structure behind the NAM population. So, again, just know your data, and then do a quick check, you know, to make sure everything's properly loaded, you know, plot the data, look at the descriptive statistics, just to make sure everything's looking right before you actually run the analysis. And then I'm just giving you some basic code um, to help you do that. Structure, it shows you the structure of the data frame, um, obviously a histogram, and then I just calculate some basic summary statistics and this line of code down here to make sure, you know, either A, that I know that there's missing lines, um, so that way if, if something didn't get loaded right, it'll become pretty apparent. And then so running that code, here is the output of the structure command. It tells you, you know, it's a data frame, there's 768 observations of two variables, taxa and protein, um, gives you that information, and finally over here in our studio, there's this continuous plot window, and here's just a plot of the histogram of the data, and it looks, you know, pretty normally dist distributed. Um, we have a few outliers perhaps in the tails, but given the sample size, it's kind of what we would expect. And then finally, again, you can see up here, here are the actual data files, and then here's the GAFIT function, that's the important in the workspace. So to run GAPIT um, with the HapMap formatted data, we need two files, the genotype file and just the phenotype file. Um, in the actual code, there's a bunch of parameters, and again, refer to the manual. There's more than I can cover today. And so today, we'll just do a basic analysis, um, accounting for population structure, using compression and not using compression, and P3D. Um, compression and P3D are kind of some more advanced topics that you may be familiar with already. Compression is basically the option of reducing your kinship matrix down to more manageable size because one of the largest, or I guess most computationally intensive steps is the inversion of a matrix. And so if you can make it smaller, it kind of speeds it up. Um, P3D stands for population parameters previously determined. And uh, basically what gap it And then finally, one advantage of the HapMap format of data is that um, GAPIT can actually handle the imputation of missing marker data. And here are three commands based on how you want to do the imputation. imputation. So here's just kind of the, the analysis. Um, remember that R is case sensitive, so it needs to be capital Y, G. Um, so here we have the method of imputation, the number of PCAs we want to use. This major allele zero, um, again, reports the allele effect with respect to the minor allele. Um, that'll become important when you look at your uh, minor allele effect estimates. And these three lines here, this actually turns off compression. And it just basically says treat each line as its own individual line and don't try and group them. Um, and then finally, you know, make sure you set the working directory where you want the files to be saved. Um, there is a lot of output that is generated. Um, and so there's a few ways you can do it in our studio. Use the session tab. In R, you can use file, change directory, and then manually with set working directory. 
And here's kind of what that looks like in the actual RStudio environment. So you can see it's again the same, same lines of code. And this is when you're not using compression. And this bottom one is if you did, compression is a default setting in Gapit, and it does the groupings by 10. And so that's kind of one of the things that you'll have to um, play around with when you analyze your own data. Here is just a page out of the manual, and you can see, and this is not even close to all of them, just the options that Gapit has available to, to it and that you need to, you know, think about and consider when you're doing your actual analyses. And so some of the output that Gap, Gapit generates, um, you'll see a QQ plot, PCA graph, allele effect estimates, BLUPS, GWAS results. So there's a lot more information than just this, but this is what I'm going to cover because this is kind of the basic stuff that you need to look at. So again, the QQ plot, um, it's pretty nice, again, because it's an R, it has really good graphing features. And so it provides a shaded area of, you know, what you'd expect for deviation from this fitted line of expected versus observed. And you can tell in our data set, we're getting a little bit of deviation from this fitted line. Um, not totally unexpected. Um, it's a pretty diverse population, and we kind of expect to see this. And then finally, here are the SNPs that, you know, are probably significant. Here is the um, PCA plot. And so in Barley, there's two main types. There's two row and there's six row. And that has to do with how many rows of kernels are on the head. And doing the PCA analysis, um, things break out into two and six row. Here's the six row germplasm. Um, Gap it also just the scree plot. Yeah. And so, you know, you need to use that information to assess how many principal components you might need to use in your model. Um, I chose three. Um, it's kind of at the bottom of the boot, and that's kind of what people recommend is when it starts to level out. And so again, Gapit generates all this. It's in a PDF file. Um, here's what you're probably most interested in. These are the GWAS results. Um, it lists the SNP, the chromosome position. It gives you a raw, uncorrected p-value. And um, I guess caution about whether or not you want to use that as you know your significant value nice thing about Gapit is it also gives you the FDR adjusted p-value and the FDR is based on Benjamin and Hochberg and the method they use. Um, Gapit also reports the minor allele frequency and one of the options that you can use is you can filter the results based on minor allele frequency and so you can set it like five percent so you'd see you know that these lines would be removed or these results. Um, it also gives you the number of observations that were used and then the R score of the model without the SNP and with the SNP. So obviously the difference between these two values is the R squared of the SNP. And in some cases it would be the R squared, squared of the QTL. So here's the allelic effect estimates. Um, in that last page you might have saw this marker came up significant. And this just gives you an estimate of the effect. And in our case, um, you know, the minor allele would reduce grain protein content by about 0.23%. And so again, Gapit generates this table for you as well. Um, it does do the genome-wide Manhattan plot. And um, you can set the significance level. And so again, the, pr the markers that show up significant for this trait, um, they're on protein, or excuse me, they're on chromosome six and seven. Um, and so you can clearly see that in the diagram. Um, Gapit also generates, though, chromosome-specific Manhattan plots. So for barley, there's this gene on chromosome 6 that has a very large impact. And there's actually two markers. They're just stacked right on top of each other. And so again, those are showing up. And you know you can cruise through each of the other, other chromosomes. And this might be a little confusing for some of you if you're not really familiar with compression. Um, basically, it gives you the methods that it's using. Um, so the, the optimal method to can calculate group kinship, they use the mean. And then there's different clustering methods. And so the best clustering method was average. 
it tells you that the number of groups was 758 and if you remember we only had 768 lines so it treated most of them as individuals and then it finally it gives you you know the negative log likelihood but it does also gap it also estimates heritability of the trait so in our case it was 0.82 which is pretty high which is what we expect for grain protein content in barley and we can talk more about this in the actual live demo so when it comes to analyzing your data um, <coughs> excuse me so most of you probably don't have data in hapmap format so what do you do um, you can build your own hapmap file if you have the genetic map and you have your genotype data you can arbitrarily code your data as AAAC or CC to represent the different analytic states of your data, the SNP calls. Um, that's one way to do it. Um, again, caution, GAPIT does not impute marker data for numerically formatted genotype files. So what do you do in that case? You can use another program like TASL, FastPhase, there's one more out there that people commonly use, I can't remember it though. Um, or you can do the imputation in R. You know, you can, if you have your data in numerical format, you can just take the average of the column and use that as miss, for your missing data. So kind of whatever you want to do. Um, if you supply it with numeric, numerically formatted genotype data, you have to provide the genetic map in a separate file. Um, and then down here, finally, in the gap at function, the parameters will kind of change instead of a G, it changes to a GD to signify to gap it that it's a numerical type genotype file and then also a GM for genetic map. And here's just a brief picture of code that you would use for um, running as numeric data. You can see the GD for numeric genotype, GM for genetic map, and everything else has stayed the same. And here's just a basic screenshot of what your genetic map should look like. You just need to have the name, the chromosome position of the markers. Um, I did get asked the question if you know if you have a species that doesn't have uh, the, the markers, what would you do? And I guess theoretically you could just make this all up. Um, you just need to provide the file and then your output would reflect that. Like if you just said chromosome one, position one for everything. Um, you know, in the output file, that's how it would show up, as every marker would be at the same spot. And here's what numeric genotype data looks like in GAPIT. It's coded based on the 210 principle. Um, Emma uses the same format. Um, and so you have your taxa, you know, your entries in this first column. And then each subsequent column is the name of the marker and the genotype call. And so that's what that looks like. And so problems, obviously, consult and user manual, and they really have done a great job of providing code for just about nearly any situation that might arise. Um, you know, you can generate your own kinship matrix in another program. You can generate, you know, your population, your Q file in another program, and it shows you how to do that, what type of code you need to use um, to import that data and run the analyses. So really, I can't stress that enough. This manual is pretty self-contained and really does a great job of explaining everything. Um, finally, check the website and check the data on the user manual that you're using. Um, it gets updated as well as the code, and the updated manual reflects the changes in the code. So I know one time I was trying to use it, and I just I couldn't even get the functions to load, and I had just had to go back and realize that they had added some more stuff. And so once I incorporated that into my code, it, ran perfectly. They do have tutorial and example data sets that I suggest maybe going through. Um, they're pretty nice. They walk you through everything and some of the other features of the app that I'm not going to cover today, like file splitting. And then finally, if you're just at wit's end and you're getting frustrated, you can always contact the makers. Um, they're very friendly and extremely helpful. These guys know what they're doing and um, they entertain most questions. Um, so in terms of getting the most out of GAPIT, you know, the code I showed you will just do a basic analysis. This is a good starting point. But as you know, those probably aren't the results you want to use or the parameters you want to use either. So you have to do it a few times. You can, like I said, there's lots of stuff that you can adjust and change. And so I recommend doing that. Um, again, towards the end of the manual, they kind of give you some more of the advanced features like the model selection, which is nice. 
Um, they provide more example script. And then finally the one I gave you um, towards the end, there's some more advanced stuff that you can do. And uh, we will cover that in a second. And briefly, I would just like to thank Alex Lipka and Zubu Zhang for their help. They've given me over the year, years, I should say, the extension team, you know, Sean and John, um, thanks a lot, and the participants. And with that, I'm going to switch over and we'll actually run the GAPIT program.